welcome to the Care Sarge Valley Magazine, a weekly program that highlights the community we live in. And brings you the beauty of the people, places, and things in the Kearsage Valley. Thank you for joining us. In the fall that I love her most of all, New Hampshire's always somewhere in my mind. Oh, New Hampshire, New Hampshire is where I want to be. I sail upon a breeze, feel the earth beneath my skis, paddle down a stream, or cast a fly, wander through a village square, breathe the cool clean mountain air, I know how it feels to be New Hampshire High. Hi, I'm Stephanie Perkins, and welcome to our continuing living history of the Kearsarge Valley. And I'm Gail Matthews, and today we are in Warner visiting with David Carroll and his wife Lorette. He happens to be an author and a consultant, and this is his latest book, The Year of the Turtle. And Stephanie will begin our visit, and uh, thank you, Gail. You're welcome. Welcome, David, to the Kearsarge Valley Magazine. A very big pleasure to be here. Yes. I'm very happy to be part of your program. Great, and it's a pleasure to meet you. Likewise. And this book that you've recently written and also illustrated just came out about a month ago? Yeah, I think it's just now finding its way into uh, various bookstores. Uh, hopefully it'll be in bookstores throughout the country. We've had real good response with it. And uh, since the end of January, really, I've been on the road almost every weekend doing talks and book signings and that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. uh, book of the Month Club has picked it up. and that, So there, there have been some very good signs, really. We're very, very happy about it. And as a matter of fact, within a week or two, it's scheduled to go into a second printing. So oh, that's wonderful. It's, mo it's moving for a turtle. <laughs> <laughs> moving slowly, but moving surely. Slowly but surely. Mm -hmm. That's great. And we'll hope it, it has a long life. Yes. I guess that's an important yes. thing, too. Yes, and it is just out, so give it some time. But uh, anyways, these, it's, the uh, illustrations are gorgeous in this book. And um, not only do you do this type of work, writing and illustrating, but you also are very well known for your murals. Well, yes, as I've had a, a bit of a career as a, mur a muralist here in the area. Um, before I got into the book so much, about four years ago, I had a period of about uh, oh five, perhaps six years, when I did a lot of work with Dwight Graves, a potter here, and Warner and his wife Mary Beth. And out of that grew a uh, technique in which I did a lot of painting on tiles using underglazes very much like I would use watercolors in my watercolor painting. But with the tiles I was able to work in a medium that was uh, much larger in scale and more permanent than watercolor on paper. And uh, for example, the piece that's in Bicentennial Square is 20 feet long, I think, by about 12 feet high. Mm -hmm. And has my one of my signature spotted turtles featured in it along with a great blue heron. Mm -hmm. And I've had uh, mural commissions at, uh, in connection with very special arts. I did one for Chubb Life America building for their collection. Mm -hmm. 
and there's one in the State House in Concord and also in the uh, Concord Public Library. Okay, and one right, right in Warner as well. And one right in Warner. In we'll fact, they later. have one, which you'll see later, and, and that one features the uh, the spotted turtle, which I, well. I guess is becoming something of the signature animal for oh, me. That's great. Now, how did you get started in the art world? Well, I, I guess uh, high school would be where I really got serious about it. I had always been one of those kids, uh, you know, my parents would say he's pretty good and put my drawings on the refrigerator door and that kind of thing, my first exhibition. And uh, But they had no real background in art and I wasn't really exposed to anything in the way of what art could be as a way of life and what mm -hmm. kind of artwork has been done in various cultures over the ages. However, at uh, my high school when I was living in Connecticut at that time, I ran into a remarkable man, Bill Miller was my teacher. He's a very good friend uh, and uh, confidant of mine to this day. <coughs> and uh, through Bill, I began to see what art really was all about and how uh, one could actually live. The, his life is almost a work of art. So that had a very favorable and profound influence on me when I first met him when I was 15. I did at the same time have a very, very strong interest in science, biology, and I had excellent teachers there who were also very good influences. I, I was very fortunate in the people I had as teachers. And it really wasn't until May of my senior year in high school that I made the decision whether to go on to study biology or art. And I think mm -hmm. I made the right one in deciding to go on to art. And so I applied rather late, as I seem to do everything, uh, to the Boston Museum School of Fine Arts, and I was accepted. And after a year there, one can apply to Tufts and be on a combined program for another four years. And uh, eventually, you get a BFA from Tufts and a full four-year painting diploma from the Museum School, a very good program. and that's. So that's what I did, and, and that's when I, you know, then of course art really became my, my main thing. Yes. That was, I was launched in that. Although you have combined it with biology. Which you is very, know. very, uh, a very nice thing, very happy thing for me. One of the many wonderful spin-offs of this book in a personal way for me is that, especially over the last three years when I finally had a contract going and I knew this was going to be a reality, the book mm -hmm. had existed as a uh, proposal for uh, 10 or 12 years with an agent in New York, really, before I got a specific contract and as soon as that happened I, I really then had the focus and a little bit of advance money where I could take the time and, and do the kind of reading of the scientific literature I had always wanted to do. I had always read some but I mean I could go to the UNH library and spend days there and that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And then I had some very strong personal contacts with uh, PhDs, professionals in the field, uh, one of whom was working for a PhD at Harvard at the time and uh, any paper or any obscure reference I wanted I could request it and she'd send it right out to me. So that was terrific for me. And then I got to know some of these people personally. Uh, for instance, Michael Clemens, who uh, wrote a wonderful foreword for my book and who has been very strong in his support of the book. Mm -hmm. um, I have now come to know him personally, not just as somebody in the literature. And uh, that's, that's been terrific. And so that whole science thing that was kind of latent and sort of had to be set aside as I did my teaching and did my artwork, uh, there, there was a glimmer of uh, sort of combining art and science probably in a period about eight years ago, there was about a four or five year stretch where I did quite a bit of illustrating for the U.S. Forest Service. Mm -hmm. And there I was working with a Dr. Shigo and, a, and a Dave Houston and did what works on ecology and tree pathology and got into some pretty high tech stuff such as drawing tree cells that I was observing through uh, binocular microscopes and actually mm -hmm. drawing the invading microorganisms penetrating the cell walls and mm -hmm. pretty pretty interesting stuff. Very uh, scientific. Yeah, and then this was the happiest of all, I think, because it's my own writing, it's my own artwork, and it's my own science, yes. uh, and I'm very pleased. That, that was another question I had. What do you enjoy more, writing or the illustrating? Uh, it, it's difficult to say. Uh, I guess overall I've done more of the visual work. Uh, the writing is something, because it's hard enough to sell, let's say, paintings and watercolors, uh, but you try selling <laughs> a couple of chapters on your turtle and swamp observations, I think you find the marketability drops be below even the low one of the other stuff. Uh, so that has been my, my primary thing. Uh, there are stretches, however, when the writing uh, really catches hold of me. Mm -hmm. and I find it almost an intrusion when I have to go back to the other side of the brain or whatever it is and work with the pen and inks and watercolors uh, when I get on a real roll with the writing, uh, primarily during the summer months because when I'm out in the swamps and the marshes and I spend part of every day out there, literally, 
it's much easier to write than it is to try to do a watercolor or a drawing and so the writing takes the four. Mm -hmm. Then during the winter months as I start to distill the writing and, and frame it up then I start to get more into the artwork and at that point I find it a little difficult sometimes to get back into that spirit of the writing. Mm -hmm. But over the now, course of the year they do both. How do you work on your illustrating during the winter? Do you have uh, actual subjects to, to look at? Oh, I've got some subjects. <laughs> can we take a look uh, at those, some of those help subjects? a lot, yeah. I mean, photos are good up to a point and my field sketches, but I've got some... This is a combination of art and science and just pure love of turtle that results in my keeping a certain number of uh, turtles through the winter. And I always try to make it clear that I don't encourage, in fact, I really discourage people from keeping these animals out of the wild. Mm -hmm. But these are ones, as part of my field work and as my, my art and science, I watch a number of species nesting, particularly spotted uh, landings if I'm ever fortunate enough to find them. And this is a wood turtle. Oh. Turtles that are on the decline very drastically in the Northeast. Yes, and, I've uh, never seen a wood turtle. Well, this is a hatchling and uh, a number of people may have seen one of these in the wild. Uh, they, they live really in a kind of a trout stream environment more than a regular marsh or a swamp or something like that. Mm -hmm. And uh, He almost looks like a snapper. Well, yes. at first glance he might because his shell's rather brown and rough and when they're young, at this age, their tail is rather long proportionally, mm -hmm. but I could bag a snapper here if I'm lucky. <laughs> well... The snapper hasn't grown as much. His, I, I did keep one hatchling snapping oh, turtle. Oh, yes. Yeah, now, much rougher. If these turtles survive once I put them back in the wild and they go on for 30 or 40 or 50 years, of course the snapper will eventually outdistance the wood turtle by quite some margin. Mm -hmm. He looks hardier. They're rough. They're like a little chunk of living muscle. Uh, mm -hmm. They're very, very tough animals and of course uh, very good at defending themselves as they get bigger. Uh, this one, having been in captivity, is not really aggressive. They lose that very quickly mm -hmm. and they, if they're disturbed in the wild, they mostly just want to get away and get back into the water. But uh, mm -hmm. Mm, of almost course, like an you, armadillo. Yeah, you give them trouble and they'll uh, they'll fight back. Whereas most turtles, of course, rely on that mm -hmm. legendary right. shell for their defense. Yeah. Yes, this guy isn't sticking his head back into his shell. He cannot retract it any more than that, actually. Mm. So you see, so and he doesn't play. have much protection on the bottom shell as opposed to the wood turtle. Mm -hmm. So he depends really on his agility and just his brute strength and his formidable bite uh, to protect himself. And I do keep a couple of turtles because what I do is I cover a number of nests each spring. That way I get data on when the eggs were laid, uh, how long it takes for them to hatch, how many surviving turtles uh, dig out of the nest from how many eggs and so forth. So I do cover a certain number of nests to keep the skunks and uh, raccoons and foxes from digging up the eggs. Mm -hmm. Over 95, 90, 95% of all turtle eggs are dug up before they ever have a what chance to get started. I just put a little piece of uh, a rectangle of um, a heavy screen, like a hardware cloth, uh, over that, and I stake it down with wooden stakes. Mm -hmm. And uh, that way, when the turtles had, I, then I, of course I have to check them each day, starting about mid-August all the way through the end of September. And in the case of some painted turtles, where the little guys actually stay in throughout the winter, they stay in that nest, I have to go back in early April and start making those rounds once a day again. And then I measure the turtles and I release them all immediately right in the natural environment, right where they were after collecting the field data. But I do allow myself the uh, pleasure and privilege of keeping um, two of each species over the winter. Uh, one reason uh, is that then I have subjects for my artwork. And then the, and the other is that this is sort of a thing called head starting. This wood turtle would take probably two years at least, maybe even three in the wild to reach this size. Mm -hmm. He's grown this big. He was not much bigger than my thumbnail when he hatched, barely over wow. an inch long. Mm -hmm. And uh, so that sort of may give him an advantage in the wild. It's hard to he say. He has a head start. But I think the primary mode is to release them at once, let the natural forces uh, take their course and protect these animals' environments so that they can, can go on their way mm -hmm. and hopefully not get wiped out here in New Hampshire, uh, which is happening in many, many parts of their yes, range. Yes, I, I hope not. Hopefully people are environmentally conscious. Well, we're hoping. Uh, we're hoping. Great. Well, they're neat So creatures. these are two of them. I should quickly show you my spotted turtle, if I okay. can find him. He's my pride and joy. Of course, there's a lot of uh, painted turtles. Yep. Yeah. Painted turtles are our most numerous turtle. They're pretty widespread throughout the state in mm -hmm. almost any wetland environment. 
This one here, uh, the spotted turtle, has become quite a cause celeb in recent years. Oh, he's gorgeous. And he's the star of the book. And the very first turtle I ever found when I was eight years old Ooh. was one of these. <laughs> uh, they have no fear of falling, so you have no, to be careful. They're used to just not. tumbling into the water. Mm -hmm. As far as they know, uh, there's water everywhere that they're about to fall into, <laughs> I guess. And so they just head right out. A uh, wood turtle won't do that because they live a lot of time on land and they have mm -hmm. learned that... Uh, that there's not always there's water not always below. Water. Absolutely. <laughs> this guy but you has see the beautiful good. bottom shell on this yes. gorgeous turtle. And, and uh, his spots are so evenly dispersed well, on his shell. on the young ones, you see, they start out with one spot per shield or scoot, as it's called. Mm -hmm. on the, But as this turtle gets older, up uh, over the next four or five years, it will develop many more spots in, mm -hmm. in rather random arrangement. More freckles. More freckles. And then actually once they reach four or five years of age, they don't add anymore. And I use that as a guide to recognizing them year after year. I mm -hmm. keep drawings of each spotted turtle I find with the arrangement of spots on it. So mm -hmm. in scientific studies, most often what is done is a little notch is filed in the turtle shell and a certain code along these marginal plates. It does absolutely no harm for the turtle mm -hmm. and it allows them the field studies to recognize these guys immediately. Yes. Mine's a little more labor intensive, but well, although it, it is their real fingerprint. Yeah, it is. So it work, It works for me. And uh, if I were going to be, out, if I knew for a fact I could be out there and study these guys for ten years, and that somebody would take over the work when I couldn't continue it, I would certainly go. For, the notching doesn't hurt them, as I say, but I, I just can't bring myself, yes. and it's not really necessary mm -hmm. for the work I'm doing. Oh, it's beautiful. Who would have? And this uh, painting that you did is of a spotted turtle. This is beautiful. The colors are wonderful. Well, thanks. Now, this is going to be given to Channel 11 to be auctioned off. Is that right? Yes, that's my uh, my wife, Lorette, who, as you mentioned, is also a painter. We ordinarily take turns each year submitting a work to uh, of that very worthy cause, and they auction it off. And this year, that when they called, they mentioned that last year I had given them a, a watercolor of a spotted turtle, and it did quite well. Mm -hmm. So I took that as kind of a hint that they might want another one, and also I thought it would work in my favor to get a spotted turtle on there, and if they mention it in connection with the book, then of course I get some advertising and so oh, forth. That's great. So I worked up a study, which as you can see is pretty similar to, uh, related in theme to ones in the book. Um, the spotted turtle, again, when I, when I do some of my drawings, the pen and inks tend to be a little more on the scientific side. Uh, I get a little more fanciful sometimes with the watercolors, and I don't necessarily show every stem on the plant and these are like mm -hmm. miniature water lilies they're actually a a plant called water shield and in the autumn they get many beautiful little colors on them they almost look like little uh, flat jelly beans of mm -hmm. different colors they do uh, so i scatter them around and i've used gold acrylic on the spot so it's a little more ornamental let's say uh, than a straight scientific study but combination of uh, well i'm supposed to be an artist too so <laughs> that, artistic i can get lessons. away with that you see. Yeah, right. <laughs> that's wonderful and speaking of your wife florette we do have a painting of hers that's very pretty you and know, I'd like do. to show it. Where did we put it out? Oh, it's, it's right, right over, there. over in the corner here. Sure. And uh, so we have two wonderful artists here. Yeah. You want to? And Maybe I can just prop this Lorette. up on the... Yeah. That'll be fine. This is Lorette's work. This and is, uh, yeah, one of Lorette's. And Lorette's right here, would you... Come on in, Lorette. <laughs> join the party. This is Lorette Carroll. And you have beautiful work. Thank you. This is wonderful. Is this a watercolor? It's an acrylic. Mm-hmm. On watercolor paper. Okay. And you have some other paintings in this room, too, that are the same beautiful colors. It's wonderful work. This is our garden. and. Uh, Fortunately for me, in a way, the two of Lorette's favorite themes are the garden mm -hmm. and then the marshes and the swamps. So we have a nice connection in that way. And because she likes the garden so much, there are, there are years when I might rather spend all my time in the swamp. I try to take the extra time to keep the garden going a bit because mm -hmm. uh, knowing that it'll be the subject of some yes. beautiful paintings like this <laughs> gives me that added incentive where I might shirk my, uh, my labors otherwise. Well, that's great. It was a pleasure talking to you both, and I'm going to turn you over to Gail, and she'll talk a little bit more. Okay, fine. Thanks a lot. I enjoyed hearing your conversation with Stephanie, and as we open up our little segment with your painting in the background, I wanted to ask you uh, how you became interested in such little creatures. I read in the Hartford Current, a late 
a recent article on you, yeah. and you said to look into the eyes of such a life and to have those eyes look back is an experience that has moved me since I first caught a turtle. You've made them romantic. Well, uh, yes, I, <laughs> I, in a way I have romanticized them a bit, and I'm, there, there really are quite a number of people who have a fascination with turtles, and uh, it may not be quite as romantic as mine. And uh, even as, as I was mentioning to somebody the other day who was asking me a, where did this interest and so forth come from, and is it really because you're such a scientist at heart? Uh, th I think that my original attachment was romantic, uh, if you will, and that as I've added the scientific component to it and so forth, it's only enhanced that kind of quality. I don't find as I learn more about them and as I learn more about their mechanics and their biology and their so forth and so on, it doesn't take away that aura that I felt as a kid. I still I'm going to be very anxious when the uh, cold wind stops blowing and the ice opens up. I'll be out looking for that first, particularly the spotted turtle, and uh, I'll, I'll feel a rush, a surge when I, when I see that turtle and uh, hopefully catch it and then check it against my notes to see. Some of them I recognize immediately now. I've seen them for over a period of five or six years. Some of them I just check back in my notebooks and I say, oh, I remember you from 1987 or something like that. Well, I noticed in the article they mentioned that you did take a little time off to look at girls when you were a teenager. Oh, yes, but I, yeah, I tried to restrict that to my teenage years. <laughs> you went back years. into the swamps <laughs> again. <laughs> well, there are some girls in the swamps every now and then, so you, you can mix in that. Are you the inspiration for the teenage mutant midgen turtles? No. They're from New Hampshire, I believe. Um, I think so. Their studio, I think, is in Northampton, Mass. right now. I know they have connection with someone in Maine. Maine has launched a major effort to uh, build what they're calling the Gulf of Maine Aquarium, I believe. And interestingly enough, they were here about uh, a month and a half ago and did videos of my turtles because they wanted some educational material. And they were in the middle of Maine in the middle of January, and they said, where in the world are we going to get live turtles? Because what happened was one of the creators uh, of the Ninja Turtles, Kevin Eastman, had given them a grant for uh, I think it was $50,000 to enable them to have a mobile van as a part of a kickoff for this Gulf of Maine project, which will eventually be a 12 to $15 million uh, deal. And this van w is going to be painted with the Ninja Turtles, but they're going to have real turtle education material uh, incorporated into it. And so they called some people in the Maine non-game wildlife, uh, endangered and wildlife program and said, we want to do some educational work with turtles. Where in the world can we find live turtles in the middle of January? And I had worked with people over there in the state. And they said, well, call this fellow in Warner, and I think your problems will be solved. So they came over, and we set up some of the aquariums. And they zeroed in with their cameras and did some wonderful filming of the uh, hatchlings that I'm head starting over the winter. And uh, on the little monitor, it looked uh, just as though you were right out in the wilds with them. Well, you're known nationally for your turtles. You'll probably be getting some turtles to model for you know, commercials. You know how they use animals. Yeah. But how did you pick Warner, or have you always been here? No, I haven't always been here. I picked Warner really uh, just one of those happenstance things. I, as I left Connecticut, as it was getting overdeveloped, and I taught for a while in Massachusetts after school in Boston, uh, then I began to see that that was getting developed as, as badly, if not worse, than Connecticut. And I said, Lorette, uh, and we had three young kids at the time, I think we've got to head north. So I just got the teacher listings. I was teaching high school art at that time and just sent looked at a map and thought, no, nah, looks like a nice place to teach and so on and so forth. And anyway, I ended up uh, teaching for one year at uh, Kingswood up in Wolfboro. And at the end of that year, I had an opportunity to teach at a small college down in Antrim that uh, has, uh, no longer exists. But uh, the opportunity there was for me, although I loved working with the high school kids very much, the system was a little hard for me to plug into in ways. and. It's such a drain on your creative uh, energy mm -hmm. and time. I wasn't able to do my own work, and uh, I love the kids. I don't think I ever laughed as much as I did when I taught high school. But I thought if I got this college job, then I would only be there two or three days a week, and I'd have much more time for my own work. And after my graduation from the museum school, that was the thing I wanted the most. So I did happen to have this job, and I went looking everywhere all over the state and couldn't find a place to live. And then. Uh, a friend called, told me he had seen a farmhouse in Warner that was for rent. I had never even seen it. I called the people up and took it sight and unseen. And you took it sight unseen. And it was a very fortunate thing for me. We moved into this town. The people were very uh, live and let live. If not outright friendly, they were at least mm. live and let very live. Very talented community. Very talented and a, and a wide range, I think, of, mm. of interests. Uh, you have the natives. You have the uh, all kinds of people from the artists to the uh, maple syrup gatherers and so forth. And there seems to be a nice tolerance and a nice feel about the town. And I. Uh, 
and also a lot of lovely open spaces. I, I was so fortunate as I began to discover some of the wetlands around here. And then I got back into the turtles. I was kind of afraid when I left Connecticut and Massachusetts. I said goodbye to my friend the spotted turtle. They, this is really pretty much the northern edge of their range. Mm -hmm. And then I was fortunate enough to find them about eight, nine years ago and uh, got right back into That's that. That's great. Now, you mentioned your three children. And uh, where are they? Are they in the area? Or? Uh, Sean's just up the road in uh, a little corner of Sutton that crosses 103 between Warner and Bradford. Uh, he's built his own house there and lives there with his wife, Mary, and Michael and Jenny. And our daughter, Rihanna, felt that it was getting too built up around here. I'm t I don't know what to do. As, as the development encroaches and as I get pretty depressed sometimes, I, I look around and I say, I can't possibly move any further north. And of course, if I do, I'll run out of turtles. So I have a serious decision to make if, if it starts getting bad. You here. have to come to Wilmot. Oh, well, maybe I'll We have 2,000 acres oh, of conservation all right. land there. Oh, that's <laughs> tremendous. Thank well, you. maybe Maine, you know, Maine has just launched a major program to save spotted and blandings turtles there. Mm -hmm. And they're trying to identify where these turtles are in the state, and, and uh, they're really putting in some very good regulations about not just saving this tiny pond, but all the necessary wetland margin areas around it, the upland nesting areas, and so forth. It's got so a marvelous that's marvelous margin, Wilma, and you won't have to leave oh, the state. Okay, I'll keep that in mind. Uh, but Thanks anyway, Rihanna just fled to the far north. She's living up in Pittsburgh. Um, I've never even been there, but uh, beautiful country, I'm sure. And th th there will be a few turtles up there still. To painted turtles and wood turtles make it that far north. And then our youngest daughter, Becky, uh, went to UNH for a year, got a scholarship there after high school, and uh, then transferred to Hampshire College in Amherst, and right now she's working on an internship with Mother Jones Magazine in San Francisco and having a great time calling up people like Louise Erdick and Michael Doris and discussing their work and fact-checking and that kind of thing. And didn't someone from that magazine just put in three and a half million dollars? To uh, he's not a, no, Becky's actually, I'm trying to use her contact with Mother Jones myself oh. to get in. I would like to get in touch with Don Henley, uh, the uh, wonderful rock singer. Uh, I've always enjoyed his music anyway, but uh, recently it's come, it's gotten some press, but not as much as I, I think it should, that he was uh, the main factor in raising something like three and a half million dollars to save some of the land around the site of Thoreau's cabin at Walden Pond in mm -hmm. Concord, Massachusetts. Unbelievably enough uh, that, well, I mean, there's just no end to this, but uh, right up to his proverbial doorstep, they were planning these office parks with buildings, uh, nine, ten That's stories. Incredible. Uh, and I, I, I was very, again, depressed upon reading about all this happening. And then I found out through some newspaper articles and contacts with people in the area that at least some of the land, much of that pond, of course, has been ruined. It's uh, poor Thoreau, if he were ever there today, he, he wouldn't have stayed long. However, they did manage to save that site, and I think that's wonderful. And I, I'm, I thought, well, you know, these, some of these rock stars and celebrities have done wonderful things about, uh, you know, aiding the starving and AIDS concerts and stuff like that. And I thought, but this seemed a little odd. I thought, how does a rock star get interested in Thoreau and Walden Pond or even find out about it? And so Becky's been in contact with his studio and then his office in Boston. I didn't realize he had an office in Boston. And I'm hoping I can get a little more of the background of the story, but apparently, as a student in high school and college, he became very enamored of Thoreau's writing and mm -hmm. so on. And then when he heard about this, he put up, I think, a fair amount of money himself and involved some other concerned celebrities, and they did some fundraising, and they've managed to save this. And I, myself, uh, would love to send him a complimentary copy of my book. I have a Thoreau quote. Uh, Thoreau is, a, is a, a, an easy quote. He's a great quote, of course, and I opened my chapter one with a quote from him. Well, marching to your own drummer is one of his quotes, and oh. you certainly have marched to your own drummer. I try, or waited to it anyway. <laughs> now, tell me something. Uh, we are supposed to be in an era where our students in the United States are not interested in science or the environment. Or how does a parent listening to this, who is very environmentally involved, start at an early age getting their youngster involved in the sciences, and what can we learn from them? And what are you seeing that we're doing positively to our environment or not positively? Well, I think, uh, to me, it boils down to some very elementary things. What we're doing positively is saving areas like your 2,000 acres in Wilmot, and what we're not doing positively... Thanks to Dick Webb. Uh, thanks to Dick Webb. Uh, and what we're not doing positively is not doing enough of that. We are just paving and turning things into backyards. Uh, we are fragmenting the habitat unbelievably. There, there are so many complex environmental issues involved in that, but the real, the real bottom line, really, the two major problems, and they're, they're one in a sense, is 
human overpopulation, which just absolutely has to be addressed on a global scale. Um, but as they say, uh, think locally and act globally, and, or act locally and think globally. Uh, that's one big one, and uh, partly as a result of that, but also partly just because of the uh, incredibly high, uh, supposedly high standard of living we've come to enjoy in the Western world, we have just uh, ransacked any natural areas. Um, I had some visitors from France go out to one of my main study areas, and they looked around, and uh, as we walked into this wetland side, uh, this fellow Jean, Jean Claude says, there's nothing like this in France, nothing in the whole country, he said. Mm -hmm. We walked a little further in, he said, is it a national park? I said, no, it's just where I come to look at turtles. And, uh, you know, you could have people from Western Europe, you could have people from all along the Atlantic seaboard south of here, it gets tough. They would have almost those kinds of reactions. And I think one of the big problems is getting young people interested so much, let's say, in the natural sciences, they, they are interested in math because, well, that's what you're traditionally told you do if you want to make money and get a good job, you, you, you want your computer skills and so forth. But there may be a lack of interest in the in the natural world because the natural world has shrunk terribly. Many kids haven't even seen it. I did an interesting project with the Forest Service about five or six years ago where they contracted me to go in to some of the inner, minority rich, as they call them, inner city schools because particularly... the in New Haven, Connecticut. Uh, this was in New Haven, Connecticut mm -hmm. area. And uh, one of the problems there, the, the uh, Forest Service was interested in getting more minorities into their research positions and so forth. But they find very, very few of the high school students uh, of the Hispanics and blacks get into this natural uh, life science in any way. They never get into it much even in high school, so obviously they're not going to go off to college. How did your experiment work? Well, I think it worked in the way that what we tried to do was say, show how an artist and a scientist could work in collaboration, and then we took them out to the wild places. That's the thing. I mean, these kids grow up in uh, inner cities. Uh, they see the show on TV, maybe, but... Uh, I think the main way we can uh, instill our young for the love of that and then have them maybe come up and protect future areas and so forth and do the kinds of field studies uh, is to leave these areas alone and then ha you know expose your kids to them and not always on a kind of a, a troop or a scientific expedition but just allowing them to just go off by themselves with their own mm -hmm. thoughts, their own intuition and just commune a bit with whatever corner or part of that happens to strike them. I don't think there's any replacement for that. And that was commonplace when I was a kid, um, we not had our all space. that long ago. We had our, everybody yes. had their space. Yeah. I mean, even in Connecticut. And we weren't programmed. We, we weren't were programmed. Our time wasn't mm -hmm. filled up. Uh, oh, man, the summers just seemed so long. Oh, I, I still cool. try, you know, to go out there and uh, approach the swamp with an eight-year-old heart, let's say, uh, to get a little romantic again. Or as William Butler Yeats would say, uh, when I was a small boy with never a crack in my heart. Uh, that, that wild land, and it wasn't just to me, I mean, kids just sort of spread out and you got lost. You, you had time to yourself, your own thoughts, and this wonderful natural background. Uh, but you see, in those days, there were hundreds of little ponds and marshes mm -hmm. and dozens of kids. Now we have mm -hmm. thousands of kids right. and maybe a dozen little And not poor, easy trash. access. Now you have, what is this, the rare species? Well, this New fellow, Hampshire? yeah, he's... You know something? I think E.T. was designed after when you were showing. I, I read that. Uh, the, the face of the turtle. The wood turtle, especially. I, seems I think to it be actually e. was. Yeah, I think. I think the I read, or someone told me that they actually used it, uh, and and the wood turtle particularly Hi, looks like E.T. You really look at your claws. <coughs> yeah. Well, he's uh, This is a male Blanding's turtle, mm -hmm. and this is uh, one of the cause celebs now. In well, Maine has recently offered it state protection. We may or may not. It's, it's being considered. It takes a while to get these things through. But and how uh, old is he? Well, you see, this fellow's old enough that his bottom shell is worn so smoothly. Show it to After me. After about 20 years, it's hard to tell a turtle's age because these, these growth lines, which are almost like the growth rings on a tree, are accurate up to perhaps 20 years. But then they get so closely compacted and the shell gets so worn that it's very it's difficult small. to get an accurate count. Very but small. a turtle this size, and he probably weighs three and a half or four pounds, uh, is probably 50 years old. These Blanding's turtles have been known to live 70 or 80 years. Hmm. And uh, each individual turtle, you see, is very important to the population. They're very slow to reach uh, sexual maturity and get back into the breeding pool. It takes the turtles in our part of the country up here 10 or 12 years to mature. Very few of them really make it through that first of 10 or 12 years. Once they do, like this male, they have an excellent chance of being breeders for another three, four, five, six decades. And this poor fellow, as, as is happening more and more now, as we have more people, more development, more roads where there weren't roads, 
was found by some youngsters who unfortunately considered him a danger or something, perhaps, but they wailed on him pretty good with sticks. He's got a scar mm -hmm. here. He's got w one eye missing. One eye is uh, not exactly missing. I don't think he's... They're pretty shy animals, and, and they will never bite. Well, uh, won't he come out of his shell? I, he probably won't while I'm handling him, but at any rate, one of his eyes is closed shut, has been since he was attacked in uh, July, I think it was. So I've kept him over the winter. He's been eating well, and he's very strong and in good shape, and I'm trying to find out exactly where he came from. It's very important that these animals go back exactly in their location that mm -hmm. they were found. Um, Well-meaning people sometimes pick them up and carry them three or four towns over to another pond. But these animals, as they live such a long time, they really get familiar with a certain area. And that becomes their home range. And that familiarity aids them in finding other turtles at breeding time. Uh, then they know where to find food. They know a safe place where they can go and get mm -hmm. through the long, long, harsh winter we have up here. And he it disorients them dangerously to move them around. He has the cutest little face. Look at those two little... <laughs> well, they have a, almost a little bit of a built-in smile, almost. They do. Yeah. They're adorable. And, and remember uh, in that hair, the tortoise and the hare, the hare won the race. No, no the, tortoise the tortoise won the, the tortoise. race. Slow right. and steady. Right, slow well, and steady. Well, this fellow's slow and steady, and he survived this attack, and uh, I'm hoping to find out exactly where he came from to return him to the marsh, because this guy is one in many hundreds that survives to, to become this uh, size, and, and he's a valuable part of that gene pool of his local territory. And they're found, these turtles, unfortunately, as the spotted turtles, are primarily only found in the southeastern corner of our state. You see, mm. that's where we have that particular type of wetland. You go north and west and you get more into a deep uh, glacial lake situation or rapid streams, great for brook trout and some wood turtles, but uh, these animals couldn't survive there. So it's that southeast corner, and unfortunately that's the very part of the state that's under the heaviest pressure for mm. development. Right. So, it's a big problem, and uh, it's going to get bigger, and I'm going to be as instrumental as I possibly can in saving some whole, whole ecosystems. Uh, it's only recently becoming known how important it is not to save this little thing and then build houses all around it and save that little thing, but the connecting wetland links and the overland corridors are vital for not just the turtles, but many other wetland animals and plants. Well, it's important for our survival as humans. Well, I believe it is. I mean, there are the practical, you always have to emphasize the practical, mm -hmm. because so many of the people on planning boards or, you know, the, the concerns with taxes, they look at these things in, in uh, ver not very romantic terms or very uh, spiritual, if you want to use that word. They say, well, uh, is this going to help my drinking water? Then I'll protect it, you know. They don't, they don't, they don't, uh, there was a fellow Somebody quoted in the monitor, I think he was uh, from Bo, who was one of the decision makers, who said, well, if we have to save that marsh because it's important to the town's drinking water, fine. But if you're just trying to save some damn frogs, forget it. And uh, I mean, that mentality, unfortunately, is all too uh, widespread. And w we just have to inform people that there's something beyond all of us living like a bunch of cattle around one hole of drinking hole, you know. Well, we have a woman in Wilma who heard the marshes were going to be uh, developed, and she literally put her body in front of the bulldozer, <laughs> and she saved the marsh. Well, we've done you know, an interview. I, her, and sometimes it takes something yeah. uh, quite dramatic, I will assure you. Uh, the real nice thing is uh, if, uh, if we could get more and more people to simply, if they own the land, if they could skip the temptation for that million dollars, and that's pretty hard. I mean, it's incredible. One of the and one of the donated for future generations. Yeah, leave the land. Leave the land. Uh, you'll be the hero in the future. I think the real heroes today aren't the people who are building the malls, no. uh, really, but the people who are saving our natural heritage. Well, it's you're so important, important for the turtle. You're important for us in New Hampshire. And I really could talk with you forever, but we have a time <laughs> restraint. And yes. I invite you it's to the. Uh, bottom of Bog Mountain, there is a wonderful marsh there. You come see the turtles I, I and the I would herons. love to. Uh, Beavers making uh, dams, it's wonderful. And uh, good, anything right? that you would like to um, say about teaching children before we go on to the Book of the Week? Well, I, I don't think so much we need to teach children. I think just like with the turtles, I think we l need to um, leave them to their own thoughts and inspirations once in a while, not try to define their existence and leave them a good measure of that natural world, which has always had an influence on the human spirit of all, all cultures, really. Um, I think that that would be worth more than any specific education program, although any of those let's go out and learn about the swamp programs have their value. But I think the real crucial thing is leave these guys and girls, leave the open spaces, and leave them the time to discover it, to feel it, to get what, and then whatever they get out of that, I'm sure they'll use it 
wonderful ways for us all. Thank you, David, for letting us come welcome. into your home. Well, it's nice to have you. And with those good words, we'll let you go back to your. We'll put him house. back in his. Uh, when he gets back get in the better. water, he he'll get very calm again. Get better. You've got a cute little smile. Yeah. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Thank you. And the house of the week this week is located in New London on Edmonds Road. It's a completely renovated home in the past two years with one floor living close to the center of town. Features include formal dining room as well as an eat-in kitchen. There are views to the main street. There's also a walkout basement which has windows and could easily be finished for more living space. The house has two to three bedrooms, one and a half baths, and is situated on a one acre parcel of land. There's a living room with fireplace, hardwood floors throughout, separate dining room, kitchen with eating area, and all three bedrooms on the main level. There's also an enclosed porch. The home is heated by forced hot air by oil, forced hot water by oil. This professionally decorated home features, again, one floor living, requires very little maintenance, and kitchen has new counters, hardware, and appliances. This home is being offered at $189,000. Call New London Agency at 526-4050 for your local realtor. And you have also good news in the real estate scene where you said that houses are really moving. Yes, in the past month real estate has picked up, so hopefully we've seen the bottom of the market and it's a good time to buy. That's good. And uh, guess what? The book of the week from Carlton, he happened to pick The Year of the Turtle, which is what we've been talking about this whole show. And this happens to be the paperback book. It is uh, $17.95, but some of the reviews have been fantastic, and uh, we could even add our own reviews, couldn't we? I could not put this enchanting book down. The life cycle of Carol's turtles reads like a well-paced mystery story. Savior of turtles, guardian of wetlands, artist David Carroll is our conscience. And that's from a fellow neighbor, too, Maxine Kuhn and poet. But there are also reviews from the American Museum of Natural History in New York and from Harvard University and from the University of Alabama. It is a book that you will not only want on your coffee table to uh, get you into the uh, reading of the turtle, but you'll find it fascinating for your children and for yourself. And uh, that's The Year of the Turtle at the Kearsage Bookshelf by David M. Carroll. And uh, Steph, do you want to wrap it up? That's it for this week, and we hope you join us for another show next week in the Kearsarge Valley area when we visit another neighbor. In another place. In another place. And uh, I think David has our thought for the week, and if he'd join us again real quickly, he will leave you with his thought for the week. David? I'd be glad to. Am I, shall I just sit here with you? Or? Sure. Sure. Good. we got room on the old Mozart couch. My thought for the week really is pretty much uh, a refrain of what I've been saying throughout our conversation, which I have enjoyed greatly. And that thought for the week is, again, about uh, the land, you know. We, we just have to start really seeing the land's real value. We have to start saving significant stretches of, of open spaces. And I think that the main thought on it is, as soon as we try to make the land pay for its way, or as soon as we try to make it have value in, in our economic terms, we sadly make it actually worthless. Uh, and that's my thought for the week. It's a good thought. Thank you very much. Thank you. Pleasure. Oh, I love her in the spring When the birds begin to sing In the winter and the good old summertime